Welcome to the online training course, ChemPAC Module 2, ChemPAC Response Procedures for Nerve Agent Incidents. The purpose of this course is to provide training in responding to a nerve agent incident. Your work here today helps to ensure an effective and coordinated response to a potential emergency requiring the deployment of ChemPAC assets in Connecticut. Module 2 covers the response procedures for the ChemPAC program. This module is targeted towards hospital personnel, first responders, public safety answering points, PSAP or 911, centralized medical emergency dispatch, and other staff and volunteers who may be involved in a response effort. Following this course, you will be able to explain what responders should do when they recognize a potential nerve agent incident, determine when to request deployment of ChemPAC assets, Describe notification procedures observed during the response, list steps taken to deploy CAMPAC assets, and explain required after-action documentation. This course is organized into five parts. We'll start with a sample nerve agent scenario. In Part B, we'll discuss what are the initial steps in a response to a nerve agent incident. Part C will explain how CAMPAC assets are deployed. Part D will explain how ChemPAC assets are utilized and describe signs and symptoms of a nerve agent exposure. Part E will discuss the after-action documentation required after an event. A final summary will provide a quick review of the key concepts covered in the course. Scenario Background At 5.35 p.m. on Wednesday, October 8th, a freight train traveling from Bridgeport to New Haven derails. 26 of the train's 79 cars are affected. Department of Transportation placards indicate that four of these cars contain hazardous materials. The cause of the accident is unknown. At 5.36 p.m., an overturned tank car from the derailed train is struck by a commuter train traveling at 35 miles per hour. The commuter train is carrying 297 passengers. According to the DOT placard, the tank car contains organophosphate pesticides. The tank is breached, spilling approximately 10,000 gallons of the chemical. Pictured below are the toxic materials placards found on the tank. A number of passengers and bystanders call 911 from their cell phones. Between 5.37 and 6.15 p.m., multiple calls are received by the Connecticut State and Local Police. The first police cruiser arrives on the scene at 5.44 p.m. As of 6.05 p.m., most passengers have been able to evacuate the train on their own, though as many 40 passengers in the first three cars have sustained serious injuries. The initial notification of the nerve agent incident will occur when the first responder on scene calls their associated dispatch, either law enforcement, fire, or EMS to report the suspected nerve agent incident. Dispatch informs their command staff and then informs CMED. As of 6.10 p.m., it is determined to be a nerve agent and the extent of exposure is unknown. Several passengers evacuated from the train and are vomiting and complaining of nausea, dizziness, and blurred vision. Two passengers are experiencing seizures. Upon learning about the size and scope of the incident, command personnel from all branches of public safety, law enforcement, fire services, emergency medical services, commit additional resources to respond. Such resources may include ambulance task forces, hazmat teams, mobile decontamination units, personal protective equipment, and other personnel and supplies needed to secure the scene, rescue victims, and provide emergency medical assistance. Upon identifying a nerve agent incident, the incident commander may request ChemPAC assets through CMED or 911. Meanwhile, CMED initiates the process of mobilizing ChemPAC assets in response to the suspected nerve agent incident. Once CMED receives word that such an incident has occurred, they immediately contact the closest facility that hosts a ChemPAC container. To facilitate this, each regional CMED unit has information on the specific locations of the ChemPAC containers and detailed contact information for reaching people at these host facilities authorized to open the container and rapidly mobilize antidotes. CMED serves as the hub of information during a nerve agent event. 
Once Incident Command is established at the incident scene, the incident commander identifies an EMS liaison. Among his or her other responsibilities, the EMS liaison provides regular status updates to CMED regarding the incident. CMED also maintains contact with the CHEMPAC host facility, receiving regular status updates on the CHEMPAC deployment process. CMED relays this information back to the EMS liaison on the incident scene so field responders can prepare to receive CHEMPAC assets. CMED also has the responsibility of notifying other hospitals in the area that a suspected nerve agent incident has occurred so they can prepare their on-site decontamination facilities and prepare to receive patients. Each CHEMPAC container includes assets to be delivered to a nearby receiving hospital. So CMED's notification of receiving hospitals also serves as a heads up to prepare to receive CHEMPAC assets. Additionally, CMED is responsible for coordinating the transport of CHEMPAC assets from the host facility to the incident scene and nearby receiving hospital since Connecticut's CHEMPAC plan requires that the antidotes are transported by an emergency vehicle. On top of all these things, CMED also acts in their usual capacity working with EMS and healthcare facilities to coordinate the transport of patients from the incident scene to area hospitals. The following slides detail the contents of these various categories of information sharing facilitated by CMED. To facilitate their preparations to receive patients, area hospitals need as much information as possible regarding the nature of the incident and the number and characteristics of victims requiring medical assistance. As previously mentioned, the EMS liaison would provide regular status updates to CMED regarding the incident. These updates will include intelligence regarding the incident itself, namely the type and severity of exposure. They would also provide updates on the number of victims requiring medical assistance. CMED shares this information with area hospitals. The EMS liaison would also provide status updates on the response efforts, such as updates on decontamination efforts, as well as the location of the staging area at the incident scene, and information regarding access so that CMED knows where to direct the responders who will deliver CHEMPAC assets. CMED will provide regular status updates to area hospitals based on the information obtained from the EMS liaison at the incident scene. CMED also maintains contact with the CHEMPAC host facilities, receiving regular status updates on the CHEMPAC deployment process. CMED relays this information along with information regarding the location of the CHEMPAC staging area to the hospitals and EMS and first responders tasked with transport of CHEMPAC assets. To ensure rapid deployment, these emergency vehicles must know exactly where at the host facility to go to pick up CHEMPAC antidotes and exactly where at the receiving hospital and incident scene to deliver them. As CMED also works with EMS and hospitals to coordinate the transport of patients from the incident scene to area hospitals, they must ascertain how many patients each hospital can accommodate in order to ensure that healthcare resources are used most effectively and no facility is overwhelmed. In some portions of Connecticut, CMED may request that hospitals activate their mobile decontamination units, or MDUs, if this has not already occurred. MDUs can also be activated at the incident scene by fire departments. CMED will then direct ambulance traffic to hospitals that are ready to receive potentially contaminated or decontaminated patients. Similarly, CMED also maintains contact with the receiving hospital to ascertain how many patients they can accommodate in order to coordinate the transport of patients from the incident scene to area hospitals. CMED also confirms that receiving hospitals receive the CHEMPAC assets they need. While CMED is working with area hospitals to mobilize CHEMPAC assets, public safety responders at the scene initiate incident response. As additional resources arrive, the incident commander is identified and incident response is initiated. Since a suspected nerve agent incident would qualify as a hazardous materials event, the incident commander would most likely be the fire chief or another representative of fire services. A suspected nerve agent incident may result in a large number of ill and contaminated patients in a very short period of time. 
If the event is a mass casualty incident, or MCI, it will require the use of the Incident Command System, or ICS, to properly coordinate all responding agencies. If you are taking this course, you may have already received training in ICS, which includes the combination of facilities, equipment, personnel, procedures, and communications operating with a common organizational structure with responsibility for the management of assigned resources to effectively accomplish stated common objectives pertaining to an incident. As part of the CHEMPAC training program, this course focuses specifically on the medical response to a suspected nerve agent incident. However, it's important to note that this medical response is occurring within the broader context of hazmat incident response. This slide shows a very simplified ICS chart designed to illustrate how medical response is a branch within the operations section. During response to a hazardous materials incident, there would be a parallel branch for hazmat operations. The hazmat branch will be responsible for response activities such as determining the locations of the hot, warm, and cold zones and performing decontamination. Critical to a safe and effective operation is the strict observance of scene safety. As per standard operating procedure, all responding agencies should implement their hazardous materials response policies. In every incident, safety is primary and response and rescue are secondary. First responders must protect themselves so they will be able to help others. To this end, one of the first things that responders on the scene should do is ensure that all responders and bystanders are located at a safe distance from the scene of the incident. After ensuring appropriate scene safety, responders should don appropriate personal protective equipment, or PPE, for the zone in which they will be working, hot, warm, or cold, and should use PPE that they have been trained to use safely. Chemical hazards often require higher levels of PPE than biological or radiological hazards, depending upon the chemical itself, the distance from the incident, and the environment in which it is released, wind or rain, etc. The incident commander and safety officer determine the appropriate level of PPE for the specific incident and provide this information to all responders. There are two types of PPE. The most conservative PPE, which is also known as Level A, includes a fully encapsulated, chemical-resistant, vapor-tight suit and supplied air via an airline or self-contained breathing apparatus. Level B PPE includes a chemical-resistant suit and supplied air. The respiratory protection is the same as Level A, but the skin protection is somewhat less. As of 6.20 p.m., 25 responders are on the scene, helping to evacuate the last victims from the train. As of 6.20 p.m., over 100 victims are complaining of headache, blurred vision, and tightness in the chest. A dozen people are experiencing seizures. While responders on the scene are initiating incident response, the nearby host facility is in the process of mobilizing CAMPAC assets. Upon receiving the request for CHEMPAC assets from the regional CMED, designated personnel at the facility open the CHEMPAC container, remove and sort the contents, and prepare the antidotes for transfer to the incident scene and to the nearby non-host hospital. Recall from Module 1 that there are two different configurations of CHEMPAC containers, hospital-configured containers and EMS-configured containers. In Connecticut, the containers are stored in fire departments, the Connecticut Department of Public Health, and hospitals. Both configurations include antidotes for use by field responders and hospitals, just in different quantities. The EMS containers are configured to include more of the supplies that would be needed by emergency medical services for field response to a nerve agent incident, namely pre-filled auto-injectors that are easier to use in the field. The hospital containers are configured to include more of the multi-use vials for precision dosing and long-term care. The EMS configured CHEMPAC containers include enough antidotes for 454 severely exposed individuals. Severe exposure would require three auto-injectors, where minor exposure may only require one. This slide lists the contents of these containers. An important distinction to note is that in the EMS configured container, 80% of the supplies are auto-injectors, which are appropriate for field use. The contents of the container are color-coded red for the field and blue for non-host hospitals. 
The hospital configured ChemPak containers include enough antidotes for 1,000 severely exposed individuals. Severe exposure would require three auto injectors, where minor exposure may only require one. This slide lists the contents of these containers. An important distinction to note is that in the hospital configured container, 80% of the supplies are multi-dose vials, which are appropriate for hospital use. The contents of the container are color-coded red for the field and blue for non-host hospitals. When treating victims of a suspected nerve agent incident, hospitals will require several additional supplies not included in the ChemPak containers. These are referred to as ancillary supplies, and recommended amounts of supplies are listed on this slide. Both host hospitals and non-host hospitals must have access to the quantities of ancillary supplies listed in the right-hand column. Upon receiving the request from CMED to mobilize ChemPak assets, designated personnel at the host hospital open the ChemPak container. To open a ChemPak container, first unlock the padlock. Once the container is unlocked, break the plastic seal across the container door. Third, slide open the deadbolts on either side of the container. Fourth, use the canvas strap to pull the front door panel upwards to the top of the container. Finally, pull the door panel out from the bottom of the container and remove the panel completely to access antidotes. Once the container is open, personnel remove all material from the container and transport antidotes to the incident staging location. ChemPak assets are marked with color-coded tags to allow rapid deployment. The color coding is to ensure that there are sufficient assets available to support hospital and field response. Boxes with red tags contain auto injectors intended to be transported to the incident scene for use by field responders. Boxes with blue tags are to be transported to non-host hospitals. Blue tag boxes contain mostly bulk medications and some auto injectors. Red and blue tagged boxes should be brought to the loading dock or designated staging area. During the process of preparing ChemPak material for transfer, host facility personnel document the amounts of antidotes transferred to authorized receiving officials using the appropriate transfer of custody forms. Copies of the ChemPak controlled substance transfer forms are stored in plastic pouches attached to the outside of the ChemPak containers. These forms are used to track the transfer of the controlled substances from one location to another. They are designed to be completed rapidly so as not to slow the delivery of ChemPak assets. Host facilities personnel complete the appropriate forms prior to transferring ChemPak assets outside of their institution and fax completed forms to Connecticut Department of Public Health, keeping copies for their hospital records. Situation Update The host hospital received the request for ChemPak assets at 6.11 p.m. ChemPak assets were ready for transfer by 6.21 p.m. While the host facility is preparing ChemPak assets for transport, CMED has arranged for an emergency vehicle to pick up the ChemPak assets and transport them to the incident scene and to the nearby non-host hospital. These emergency vehicles arrive at the host facility staging location and antidotes are rapidly loaded into the vehicles. Red tagged boxes to be delivered to the incident scene in one vehicle and blue tagged boxes to be delivered to the non-host receiving hospital in another vehicle. Simultaneously, CMED and PSAP, or 911, notifies the State Emergency Operations Center. The State Emergency Operations Center will coordinate any additional ChemPak deliveries. Once ChemPak assets are delivered to the scene, first responders use the antidotes to treat patients. Responders should operate according to standard protocols and or follow directions of the incident commander and treatment officer. Triage has likely already begun by this point, and triage and treatment should continue until all patients have been evaluated and treated. The following slides describe the signs and symptoms of nerve agent exposure and some guidelines for treatment. Patients requiring additional medical treatment or further follow-up should be transported from the scene to area hospitals. As usual, EMS should coordinate this with CMED so that the hospitals can anticipate how many patients to expect. 
The acronym SLUGEM can be used to remember the signs and symptoms of a nerve agent exposure. Someone who has been exposed to a nerve agent, such as an organophosphate pesticide, will likely exhibit several of the following symptoms. Salivation, lacrimation or tearing, involuntary urination or defecation, gastrointestinal upset, emesis or vomiting, muscle twitching, and meiosis or pinpoint pupils. Exposure to nerve agents has the potential to affect the central nervous system, respiratory system, cardiovascular system, skeletal muscles, and eyes. Mild symptoms of nerve agent exposure include headache, blurred vision from pinpoint pupils, tightness in chest due to smooth muscle constrictions, excessive sweating, tearing, salivation, and unexplained runny nose. Moderate symptoms include drooling, difficulty breathing, vomiting, fatigue, diarrhea, muscle twitching, muscle weakness, and blurred vision from pinpoint pupils. Severe symptoms include moderate symptoms plus involuntary urination, convulsions, cardiac irregularities, respiratory failure, wet lung sounds, and altered mental status. The amount of antidote required to treat nerve agent exposure depends on several factors, including the severity of exposure. If approved and trained to do so, responders should assess each patient's degree of symptoms and administer one to three Mark I or similar kits to adult patients showing evidence of nerve agent exposure. As a general guideline, administer one auto-injector to patients demonstrating the signs and symptoms of mild nerve agent exposure, two for those with symptoms of moderate exposure, and three to those with severe exposure. As all patients are different, responders should continuously evaluate each patient's status and update the treatment plan as needed. According to a recent article in Current Opinion in Pediatrics, the use of adult-formulated atropine and pralidoxime auto-injectors will deliver doses above current recommendations for infants and children. Data demonstrate, however, that atropine overdose is generally well tolerated in young children. Children symptomatic of nerve agent poisoning will likely need both supraphysiologic doses and frequent redosing of atropine. Symptomatic children under one year of age should be given a full atropine dose from the Atropen or Mark I kits while children over one year of age should be given a full dose of both atropine and pralidoxime from the Mark I kit when more accurate weight-basing dosing of antidotes is impossible. For more detailed EMS guidelines on pre-hospital response to suspected nerve agent incidents and mass casualty events, all responders are encouraged to review the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry website of Medical Management for Guidelines for Nerve Agents. There are several nerve agent antidotes, drugs that, if administered soon enough, can reverse the effects and alleviate the symptoms of nerve agent exposure. The three nerve agent antidotes included in Kempac are atropine sulfate, pralidoxime, also referred to as 2-PAM, and diazepam. Atropine is administered to treat the potentially debilitating symptoms of nerve agent exposure, while pralidoxime is used to reverse the aging process caused by the chemical. Diazepam is only used to treat patients experiencing seizures. The top photo on this slide shows a Mark I auto-injector, which contains both atropine and pralidoxime. The photo at the bottom of the slide shows a diazepam auto-injector. Auto-injectors facilitate timely treatment by providing simple, accurate, rapid drug administration. They contain pre-measured, controlled doses of the nerve agent antidotes, atropine and 2-PAM chloride. Moreover, there are no vials, ampules, or syringes to manipulate. The Mark I auto-injectors are fully automatic and designed of rugged construction. They are FDA approved and commercially available for use by civilian emergency medical personnel in the event of an accidental release of nerve agents or organophosphate pesticides. To use Mark I auto-injectors, first firmly grasp the injector and remove the safety cap. This will be the yellow on atropine and gray on 2-PAM. 
Be sure not to touch the colored end of the injector after removing the cap, as the injector is designed to function if any pressure is applied, and it may inject into fingers or hand if touched. Next, place the colored end, green on atropine and black on tupam, on the thickest part of the patient's thigh and press down until the injector deploys. Pressure automatically activates the spring, plunges the needle into the muscle, and forces the medication into the muscle tissue. Hold the injector in place for 10 seconds, then remove and massage the area of injection. This helps the medication to enter the muscle tissue. After the auto-injector has been activated, the empty container should be disposed of properly. Note that it is meant for one-time use and cannot be refilled nor can the protruding needle be retracted. It should be disposed of in a sharps container per rules for handling medical wastes and possible bloodborne pathogens. Once this is complete, note the dosage administered to the patient on his or her triage tag or elsewhere on the patient. Writing the dosage on the patient's chest or forehead is also acceptable. A duodote is a single injector that supplies both atropine and pralidoxine chloride simultaneously. You should administer the duodote auto injector the same way as the Mark I auto injectors. Situation update. Chempac assets were delivered to the incident scene. All victims have been evacuated and gross decontamination is underway. Over 150 victims are complaining of headaches, blurred vision, and tightness in chest. Three victims are in acute respiratory distress. Chempac assets were delivered to the non-host hospital at 6.37 p.m. 30 victims of the crash left the scene and went directly to the two closest hospitals. These victims have not been decontaminated. Upon hearing about the crash in the news, an additional 150 area residents have presented to these hospitals with complaints of nausea and shortness of breath. None were within 500 yards of the crash. In parallel to field response to the suspected nerve agent incident, hospital personnel prepare to receive patients who were potentially exposed and require evaluation and treatment. Per the Kempac deployment plan described in previous slides, the Kempac container includes antidotes for use by both the host hospital and nearby non-host hospital. Once these antidotes are delivered, hospital emergency department personnel should treat patients according to clinical protocols based on intelligence about the incident relayed by CMED or the Connecticut Poison Control Center. Usual hazmat plans indicate that victims are decontaminated before they are transported to hospitals for further evaluation and treatment. However, hospitals should anticipate that some people will leave the scene of the incident and self-present to the hospital perhaps prior to decontamination. Hospital decontamination plans should be activated immediately upon notification that a potential nerve agent incident has occurred to ensure that hospital personnel and other patients are not put at risk. Additionally, in the event of any mass casualty event, hospitals should anticipate a number of patients presenting who have heard about the incident but were not exposed. These patients may be exhibiting psychosomatic symptoms that can be difficult to differentiate from the signs and symptoms of mild nerve agent exposure. When Kempac is deployed to treat victims in a nerve agent release, clinical specimens will need to be collected. The Laboratory Response Network for Chemical Terrorism, or LRNC, was created in 2003 to improve the nation's health response to chemical exposure events. 62 public health laboratories are part of the network and are available 24-7 to analyze clinical specimens. The Laboratory Response Network for Chemical Terrorism is ready to help clinicians to collect specimens and to perform quantitative analytical testing. Clinical specimens collected after a chemical exposure have many important uses, such as to determine who has been truly exposed, to establish the temporal distribution of exposure, to identify chemical agents, if necessary to aid in law enforcement investigations and prosecutions, and to allow for epidemiological follow-up of individuals who are exposed. Connecticut can analyze for nerve agents, sulfur mustard, ricin, abrin, cyanide, toxic metals, volatile organic compounds, and other chemical weapons. In an unknown exposure event, 
Clinical specimens can also be sent to the CDC for identification. The CDC can analyze for over 150 chemicals or metabolites using the Rapid Toxic Screen, or RTS. After a suspected nerve agent incident, hospitals should collect urine samples from potentially exposed patients and send these to the Connecticut Department of Public Health Laboratory for analysis. When possible, urine samples should be collected seven to eight hours after exposure. 25 to 50 milliliter samples should be collected in screw cap urine cups, and two blanks should be sent for each lot number used. Samples should be frozen at negative 20 degrees Celsius and shipped on dry ice. Laboratory samples should be sent by courier to the state laboratory to the address shown on this slide. The after action documentation process is collaborative, involving the incident commander, public safety dispatchers, CMED, and the Kempac host agency. The after-action report describes the incident, including the timeline of events, the location, and the agencies involved in response. The report also includes a critique of the effectiveness of CHEMPAC deployment. The inventory of all used and unused CHEMPAC material is also documented. Once removed and deployed, unused CHEMPAC material is never put back in the CHEMPAC container. Once incident response is complete, all unused material from the CHEMPAC remains where it is, either in possession of the host facility, the non-host hospital, or EMS. The remaining material is inventoried and deducted from the inventory initially delivered to determine how much was used during incident response. Tracking of diazepam is particularly important as this is a Schedule IV drug and most hospital pharmacies maintain only a limited supply in their regular inventory. This information is sent to the Connecticut Department of Public Health SNS coordinator within four days following the conclusion of the event. The host facility, non-host hospital, or EMS agencies should retain the material in the interim and wait for further instruction from the Connecticut Department of Public Health. You have completed Module 2 of the Connecticut CHEMPAC training program. You now should be able to answer the following questions. What should responders do when they recognize a potential nerve agent incident? We reviewed guidance on how to recognize a chemical incident requiring mobilization of CHEMPAC assets and highlighted the elements of response that may differ from response to other types of emergencies. When should responders request deployment of CHEMPAC assets? We reviewed the circumstances under which CHEMPAC assets should be requested. What notification procedures should be observed during the response? We detailed the overall system response procedures that would be observed in the event of nerve agent incident. What steps should be taken to deploy CHEMPAC assets? We described the steps involved in detail. What kind of after action documentation is required? As the CHEMPAC assets are the property of the CDC, we describe the special guidelines for documenting what material was used and reporting this information to the Connecticut Department of Public Health and the CDC.